Hi everyone, today we will begin our study of surfaces. For us, a surface is going to be a connected subset of the space that is locally the graph of a smooth function. Remember that a function f of two variables is called smooth if all its partial derivatives exist. More precisely, we say that a connected subset sigma of the three-dimensional space is a smooth surface if for any point p in sigma, we can find an open set u containing p and a coordinate system for which the portion of sigma containing u is the graph of a smooth function with open domain with respect to this new coordinate system. Sometimes we will call smooth surfaces just surfaces. Before we move further, let's review some examples of smooth surfaces. If f is a smooth function of two variables with connected open domain, then its graph is a smooth surface. If sigma is the plane given by the equation ax plus by plus is d equals to d, then by isolating d in this equation, we can describe sigma as the graph of the function d minus ax minus by over c. Of course, provided c is not zero. If c is zero, then at least one of a or b is not zero, and we can use another coordinate system in a similar way to describe sigma as the graph of a smooth function. A more interesting example is the unit sphere. It is certainly not the graph of a smooth function with respect to any coordinate system, but for any p in sigma, there is a portion of the sphere containing p that is the graph of a smooth function with respect to an appropriate coordinate system. This means that the unit sphere is a smooth surface. On the other hand, if sigma is the closed unit disk in the xy plane, then it is not a surface, because if we take p in the edge of sigma, then for any coordinate system, no neighborhood of p in sigma is the graph of a function with open domain, let alone smooth. Another example of a smooth surface that is not a graph is the Möbius band, obtained by gluing the two ends of a rectangular strip after flipping one of those ends by 180 degrees. Notice that the strip that we consider in here does not include its edges, because if it did, it wouldn't be a smooth surface, just like the closed disk in the plane. Now we will give two important sources of examples of surfaces. If we have a smooth function f of three variables, then its level sets are usually surfaces. For example, if f is given by x squared plus y squared minus d squared, the preimage of a real number c is given by a one-sheeted hyperboloid if c is positive, a two-sheeted hyperboloid if c is negative, and a cone if c is zero. The cone is not a surface, as no neighborhood of its vertex looks like the graph of a function. But as long as c is not zero, each connected component of the level set f equals to c is a smooth surface. This is part of a more general result that says, if we have a smooth function f of three variables, and the real number c is such that for any point p in the preimage of c, the gradient of f does not vanish at p, then each connected component of the level set of f corresponding to c is a smooth surface. This theorem is basically a reformulation of the implicit function theorem in three variables. For each p with f of p equals c, the condition of the gradient of f not vanishing at p means that at least one of the partial derivatives of f does not vanish at p, say, the partial derivative of f with respect to x. So by the implicit function theorem, in a neighborhood of p, we can write x as a smooth function in terms of y and z. Since p is arbitrary, this shows that each connected component of the level set f equals to c is a smooth surface. Another convenient way to characterize surfaces is via parametrizations. If we consider an arbitrary smooth function from an open set of the plane to the space, the image may look nothing like the graph of a smooth function. To guarantee that a smooth function from the plane to the space produces a smooth regular surface, we require the map to be regular. Recall that a smooth function phi from an open set of the plane to the three-dimensional space is called regular if the vectors partial phi with respect to u and partial phi with respect to v are linearly independent. With this definition, one can show that if u is an open subset of the plane and phi is a smooth regular embedding from u to the space, then the image of phi is a smooth surface. To see this, notice that for each p in the image of phi, the fact that the pair of partial derivatives of phi at u0, v0 are linearly independent means that projecting them onto a suitable coordinate plane 
say the xy plane, they give a pair of linearly independent vectors, a basis of R2. So by the inverse function theorem, there are neighborhoods v1 of u0 v0 in the uv plane and v2 of x0 y0 in the xy plane, such that phi composed with the projection is a smooth homeomorphism with smooth inverse from v1 to v2. Notice that the inverse of this composition, which we call psi, composed with phi is a smooth map that respects the x and y coordinates, so its image is precisely the graph of the smooth function of x and y, the smooth function being precisely the third coordinate of the composition of phi and psi. This proves the theorem, which implies the following characterization of smooth surfaces. A connected subset sigma of R3 is a smooth surface if and only if, for any point p in sigma, there is an open set u containing p, an open set w in R2, and the smooth regular embedding phi from w to R3, whose image is precisely the portion of sigma contained in u. The maps phi given by this corollary are called the charts, coordinate charts, or parametrizations of the surface sigma. We will finish this lesson with some examples of charts for some surfaces. If sigma is the graph of a smooth function f of x, y with domain u, then one can consider the chart phi from u to r3 given by u, v, f of u, v, which covers the entire surface sigma. If we put u under sigma, then what this chart does is simply lifting the domain to the graph. If sigma is the unit sphere, then by taking u to be the open unit disk in R2, and phi to be given by u, v, square root of 1 minus u squared minus v squared, we obtain a chart that covers the upper hemisphere of the sphere. Modifying phi by a minus sign in the third coordinate, we obtain a chart that covers the lower hemisphere. These two parametrizations together cover everything except the equator. To cover the equator, one can simply permute the coordinates of phi to obtain charts that cover the hemisphere with positive y-coordinate or the hemisphere with negative y-coordinate, etc. Another chart we can use for the sphere is the stereographic projection. For each point p in the xy plane, we consider the line passing through p and the south pole, and let phi of p to be the point where this line touches the sphere again. If p lies inside the unit disk, then phi of p will lie in the upper hemisphere, and if p lies outside the unit disk, then phi of p will lie in the lower hemisphere. I will leave it to you to check that the function phi I just described is given by this formula, and this is smooth regular. If we do the same projection again, but now using the north pole instead of the south pole, we obtain another chart given by the following formula. These two charts together cover the entire sphere. If sigma is the Möbius band drawn here, one can use the parametrizations given here to cover the band by two rectangles. Even though the two parametrizations have the exact same formula, we cannot use a single parametrization to cover the entire band, as we will see in future lessons. This is somehow related to the fact that the Möbius band only has one side. And that's it for today, see you next time.